Welcome to Strange Familiars. If you've seen something strange, a cryptid like Bigfoot, a ghost, a UFO, if you've had an experience with aliens, anything paranormal, and you want to share your story, you can email us, strangefamiliarspodcast at gmail.com. Before we get going, I want to thank everybody who has ordered my new book, Apparitions, Illustrations of the Other. There are still, of course, plenty of copies available. You can find it at our Etsy shop. Shop name Lost Grave, links in the show notes. It is also on Riverbend Comics, Riverbend Comics stocks, my art book, and all of my books. It's also run by John, who's a sometimes co-host of the show and an awesome friend. There's comics there too, I would presume. Awesome comic shop. So you check out Riverbend Comics. They are riverbendcomics.com. Link will also be in the show notes doesn't matter to us whether you get it from us or get it from Riverbend. Hopefully at some point we'll get them on Amazon. Amazon's doing something. We- I think with the COVID stuff right now, they're not accepting new publishers into their warehouses or something like this. Uh, because you might have coughed on the first four pages or something? No, I don't believe that. Too. It's that, just I, logistics. Yeah, I think it's just logistics. And so this is uh, technically a different publisher because I'm not doing it POD the way the other books are done. It's, it's a whole thing. Mm-hmm. But Hopefully we'll get it on Amazon before too long. You can get it locally at American Daydream Antiques in York as well, if you're local. Most of the people listening probably aren't local, so get it from us. You can get it from John at Riverbend. We're happy no matter which way you get it, as long as you get it. All the copies John has, by the way, are also signed. So whether you get it from me or you get it from John, you're going to get a signed copy. So that's Apparitions, Illustrations of the Other. Thanks, everybody, for your support on that. Well, tonight, we have another tragic figure from history. (laughs) You know, I love a tragic figure. The bonus on this one, she's also really, really beautiful. I think most careers are aided by that. It's also understandable why we do basically radio. (laughs) (laughs) This feels to me akin to the hermit stories we do, right? Yeah. But she's so much prettier than William Woodruff. (laughs) Yeah, (laughs) she had options. She is really, really good looking. I am very attracted to this woman. I will turn the book over and look at her once more. Boy, what a looker. She's got some Morticia vibes, I think, so that's probably part of the... Oh, that's, yeah. I can, yeah. She's got that 60s monster, dark-haired beauty. Oh, uh, she's just gorgeous. Not to go on about that, but that didn't hurt my willingness to uh, draw a picture of her for the episode art. So who we're talking about is Janice Jan Bryant Bartell. Her name was Janice. She went by Jan. Actually, you found out that... Yeah, her that name one. really was Muriel. <laughs> <laughs> Jan sounds much more dramatic. But yeah, let's talk about the sort of weird thing that led us to this story. Well, I just happened to find this book while we were out like antiquing, and I was like, this looks like something you'd be into. It was pennies yeah, on yeah. the dollar. I mean, that's the thing. It's, it's really cool. This book is, I guess it's a collector's book now. It's rather expensive when you buy it. Today's episode is going to be based on this. It's, I like it because it like the, this hardback version of it has that same. Um, there's just a look for like a lot of like spooky '60s supernatural kind of books, and this just it looks just like some of my other favorite like sort of supernatural '60s books. Yeah. So the book is Spindrift, Spray from a Psychic Sea, and it's written by Jan Bryant Bartell, who we're going to be talking about tonight. It was released in a mass market paperback with the really cool painting on the cover which i'm kind of looking for that one as well i'd like to collect that one they're pretty expensive but maybe if somebody out there finds a cheap copy somewhere yeah uh, and they wouldn't mind parting with it i would like to get a copy of that or you know i'd trade somebody one of my books for it or something like that so just the basics on jan bartell she wasn't born jan bartell no i found her real name was muriel muriel 
Uh, Muriel Bryant. She yeah. Was born. So she was born early twenties. I guess she was born in New York, and her father was a furrier, which I thought was, I found really interesting because she's nearly the, the same age as Deanne Arbus, who was the famous freak photographer in the '60s, mm-hmm. and her father was a furrier in New York too. So I think, like, I wonder how how closely. Yeah, they, they, they had, had to travel the same circles, at, at least at some point. Yeah, and just like being into such odd things as she was. And like, mm-hmm. I wonder if they might have known each other at some point. Well, she wrote Spindrift in 1973, but she died before the book was published. Is that her only novel? She wrote some poetry. Oh, yeah, and I saw she wrote something about she had a, like a deep love for animals and wrote something about a, her dog. Or She wrote something about her dog. Penelope, who features in this book, that was published in, I think, Woman's Day or one of those type magazines, Good Mm -hmm. Housekeeping, something like that, one of those magazines. She was an actress. She performed in a few off-Broadway shows, and she gave lectures at women's clubs around the country, mostly on the East Coast. We found newspaper articles of her giving lectures in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, Stroudsburg, and various places in New York and so forth. The story of Spindrift, though, is in many ways a strange, familiar story. I think if you've heard our guests that talk about hauntings and poltergeist activity and synchronicities, the story really fits in there. Like mm-hmm. this, you'll recognize certain things in Jan's story that you've heard on Strange Familiars before, so which is another reason why mm-hmm. this is it's really appealing to me. She has an interesting writing style, too. It's very dramatic and almost overwrought. And like you said, it's very Baroque. But it's, it's sort of perfect for that, like, 60s Gothic revival. Kind yeah. of, like, Gothic literature revival, yeah, monsters she, and dark shadows. It it's all seems to fit very much within that. In the last chapter, she says something like, if this reads like a Gothic novel, it's because my life is like a Gothic novel. <laughs> it's something <laughs> a, along those lines, you know. And it does kind of read like that. It, yeah, I mean, if you if you enjoy that kind of writing, it's pretty wonderful. So Bartel's haunted tale begins in 1957. She finds an old apartment in Greenwich Village on 10th Street, West 10th Street. She's not alone, though. She's married, right? She's married. She has a husband, Fred, who was in World War II and suffers, apparently, from PTSD, although they don't say that by name in the book, but he has horrible dreams in which Japanese soldiers are chasing him all the time. They don't share a bed. She sleeps in a different room because apparently he just has these horrible nightmares. The Bartels, they enjoyed old architecture and antiques, and they found this old house, and they just thought it would be like a showcase for their antique collection, and they loved it, and they moved in. And it was humongous, right? It's like like a huge old brownstone. It It was apparently massive because it's... 14 and 16, I believe, is the address on uh, West 10th Street of the two properties we're going to be talking about. And I think at one time they were one house, Mm -hmm. and then it's been divided. And even on the one side, as we'll hear about later, I think there was 10 families living on one side. So it must have been massively big. Mm -hmm. You know, originally it must have been. It reminds me of like the Collier House, one of those big uh, townhouses that they were just able to fill because they had like 20 rooms. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, Mark Twain once lived on one side of this house. Yeah, he figures pretty prominently in the whole history of the house, right? Yeah. So we'll get into a little Mark Twainage here. The night Bartell and her husband moved in, the very first night, remember she's sleeping in a different room Mm -hmm. than him. Before she falls asleep, she witnesses what she calls a monstrous black shadow. Like this is the night they move in, the first night she's sleeping in this. She described it. Blacker than night. Which, oh, that's a that's a common strange familiar thing. Yeah, yeah. So this black shadow kind of looms over her, and then goes away, but leaves her pretty scared. Yeah, because she's the in the room night. by herself. Yeah, yeah. As she screams, and Fred comes running. At this point, he's unconvinced she saw anything other than you know a shadow of a tree or something on the wall, and she's insisting. Mm-hmm. That, no. It's an unfamiliar house. You could say, oh, you know, you're just right. getting used to things. Fred is definitely more skeptical of the two, mm-hmm. but ends up coming around before the end of the story. The Bartels, uh, they settle in this apartment. They bring all their own antiques in, and uh, she finds a a box of shards in the one closet. It's just this box in the back of the closet she pulls out, and it's a... Like it's a, pottery? Like China? China shards. 
and it's just all this broken china in this box you're left wondering like were these dishes that you know the ghosts quote unquote or poltergeists have broken over the years that someone just put in this box is that what she's thinking too or i don't even think she implies that but that's you know as i'm reading why would someone save a box of broken yeah it's just a weird thing the guy that lived there before was basically living there part-time and using it for antique storage so Mm -hmm. was that things that got broken yeah it's just a weird quirk that he had where he threw this these shards in a in a box and was one day intending to repair them or i don't know i would be mosaic artist it's It's a weird detail though yeah just to find that in the closet so the Bartels settle in, you know, and things aren't happening every day. But she does have this sense of foreboding that mm-hmm. just something isn't right in this apartment. She begins to hear footsteps. And of course she assumes it's people. Are the and she's living on one side of this huge like right. brownstone townhouse and are there people on the other side or there is it are, vacant? There are people on the other side. Okay. So yeah, so she's wondering. You can rationalize that if there's people anywhere around. Right. Or is she hearing things from, from other areas? And, and she does note, like, you know, at one point she hears harp music. And she's like, what the heck is going on here? You know, where is this? Like, am I hearing, mm-hmm. you know, ghostly harp playing? What's going on? She does end up, like, kind of following it downstairs. And one of her neighbors actually has a harp, you know. And, <laughs> you know so she does kind of debunk some things throughout the book. She's well, she not, does need to sleep at night. <laughs> she's not a total, like... You know, every shadow's a ghost kind yeah. of person. So, yeah, she she assumes these footsteps are people. Until one night, she's awakened by the growling of Penelope, the aforementioned Irish Terrier, which she wrote the poem about, mm-hmm. and something coming down the hallway towards her room. So the dog's growling at something. And she can hear it. Yeah, she can hear it, it coming towards her. And she thought it was her husband. And calling out, though, she received no answer. And there was no one in the hall. She went out to check. Fred was asleep. So now she's had these, you know, sort of two definite things. She's seen this shadow. She's heard these footsteps. She begins to wonder what's going on in this place. Mm -hmm. She begins to immerse herself in the paranormal. Samuel Weiser, the occult publisher. We have, I don't know how many books by Samuel Weiser in this Mm -hmm. house. They actually had a bookstore there. So she's actually going to Samuel Weiser books Mm -hmm. and buying occult books at this time. She says she's... She doesn't even know why she wasn't interested before, but now she's she's getting more and more interested in, you know, the occult and spiritualism and, and things like this. This is a quote from Jan. The question was no longer if I was being haunted, but by whom and for what purpose. Far from diminishing, the phenomenon in the apartment became more personal, as though the intelligence behind them, gratified by my increased awareness, was attempting to put the contact on a more intimate level. Do you I, think she's feeding it through her interest in the occult? I think Jan is haunted. I think yeah. this is one of those cases. Now, Well, the building's haunted, I, too. Again, yeah, <laughs> we'll, we'll get back to that. It might be a case of uh, a little of both going mm-hmm. on here. At some point, Jan comes to the conclusion that she's psychic because she's experiencing this more than Fred. But Fred is experiencing it as well. He will eventually hear these things and see some things that convince him. Uh, She would feel something brush across her cheeks at night sometimes, as if someone was lightly touching her face, she said. There were smells in the apartment, sometimes good, sometimes bad. In the beginning, they were mostly pleasant, pleasant but unexplained kind of perfumes Mm -hmm. that weren't her perfumes Mm -hmm. they would smell. They were advised by a friend to ask the phenomenon to kindly stop. Again, something you hear on Strange Familiars. Mm -hmm. One night she heard some unexplained noises, Usually they were centered around the piano. She had a a baby grand piano. Mm -hmm. She was also a composer. Very interesting woman. And uh, she heard some of these sounds. She asked them to stop, and they stopped. Well, that's convenient. (laughs) (laughs) So the the reason I say I think it's Jan that is haunted is this strangeness kind of follows her outside of the home sometimes. And at one point, she's outside in bright daylight, and she sees a beach ball-sized orb in the middle of the street in New York City. Here we have orbs of light. Check another Strange Familiars box. There's another story that she tells where she finds the elementary school, the the old public school that her mother went to in -hmm. New York. And she's visiting, and they have closed off the upper floors. They're no longer safe for children to be there. But the superintendent of the school or the principal or somebody lets her go up and says, you know, because she says, like, I'm here, you know, because my mother went here. I'm just interested. I want to see where she went to school. 
And also, she's beautiful, so people let her do stuff like this all the time. Yeah, I think that that yeah. does open some oh, doors that are yeah. <laughs> not just, open for other people. Yeah. What do you need? We'll make it happen. And uh, she goes up there, and she gets the idea. She says she just gets the feeling that she wants to take something back with her, take something away. And she's looking for an inkwell, and she can't find one. And she reaches in this back in this cabinet. She climbs up on a table, probably in full heels, you know? Cause it's, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's like late 50s, yeah. right? reaching back in this cabinet and she pulls out this little songbook that had been there from the time like it was published in the time where Mm -hmm. where it might have been used by her mother Mm -hmm. it was that old she thumbs through it and finds a song that her mother used to sing and she she wonders if this was her mother's song but you know there's no way Mm -hmm. to prove it of course but she's walking out and the principal sees her and of course lets her keep the book because of course yeah. yeah She's cast in this play as a blind person, and she wants to get in character, so she starts blindfolding herself around the house for a while, so she can get the feeling of what it's like to be blindfolded. While she has this blindfold on, she starts smelling something like like musky but sweet, she said. You know, it wasn't unpleasant, but it was very, like, musky and sweet. And she could hear her dog start to react to something. So she takes off her blindfold, and she sees this smoke-like white apparition kind of pulling away from her. That was the last she wore her blindfold in the house. See, yeah, see, that's what I was thinking. If I were being haunted, the last thing I would do would be walking around blindfolded. So then she goes through a period of kind of feeling sick, and she blames this on the house. Uh, she, th- she wonders if it's the house kind of turning her sick. They hired a cleaning lady to help around the apartment, and this cleaning lady at one point says, Mrs. Bartell, did you just walk by me? And she said she's in a completely other part of the apartment. She says, no, I'm, I'm back here. And she says, you didn't just walk by me. And she says, no, I didn't. And this clean lady just gets up and leaves. She says she saw a, a woman in white walk by her. And Ooh. she never returns. Smart. Now, she's the smartest person in the book so far. <laughs> <laughs> then they go through a series of cleaning ladies. Like, none of them stayed long. Not they all probably heard from the, the cleaning lady union. They were like, do not go there. Yeah. It, it this, meant- this name, this house is going to get a name soon that is going to be synonymous with you not wanting to be there. <laughs> well, eventually, they give up looking for cleaning ladies because they just mm-hmm. can't get anyone to stay. So next we have this weird, you know, possible port or something that they eat dinner one night and they go to watch a film on TV. And Jan returns to the kitchen. Fred falls asleep on the couch. She returns to the kitchen, and on a plate, which they had had cake, I believe, or something, she said there's just this single grape sitting in the middle of her plate. It was dried, this old dried grape, just sitting right in the middle of her plate. And she said, we haven't had grapes in this house for months. She calls her husband in, and he says, oh, it must have been a mouse, put it there or something. And she's just like... No, why would a mouse put it perfectly in the center of the plate? She's completely unconvinced. Oh, I have so, I have some some theories about what's going on here. The symbolism there's a little too much. Really? Yeah. Do we get to do it now? Or? I think someone who's incredibly beautiful, who spends their whole life being rewarded for the the sort of dramatic, youthful actress kind of roles, when they see like a dried up grape, when you're, like you're literally drying up, like your beauty is fading into. That may be, in fact... Part of the haunting is age. Yeah, it it may be, in fact, what's going on here. She is definitely, you know, heading towards middle age. My (laughs) age. At this point. So, you know, that that may, in fact... Would have been better symbolism to actually be literally dying on the vine, though. (laughs) (laughs) Symbolism becomes a part of this. Mm -hmm. Like, she doesn't even know what synchronicities are. And someone gives her a book when young at some point, and she realizes, oh, I'm having synchronicities. So along with this haunting... That's the last thing this woman needs, is someone to tell, to validate this. <laughs> inside and outside of her house, she's having these synchronicities as well. So she argues with Fred about this grape, and eventually he agrees something weird's going on. That is peculiar that you don't... Because if something, a mouse, a rat, whatever, put that there, it, it's not going to be so perfect. Like it would be, And there would be signs of... There's never an animal that leaves that kind of a trace that doesn't leave other kinds of traces of it being there. Right. And at some point, a little bit later in the story, she does bring an exterminator in. They leave one day and they come back and there's this, they would just get this smell in the apartment. They couldn't even tell where it was coming from. It would just permeate the apartment. Sometimes, like I said, it would be like sickly and sweet. And sometimes it would be just really, just a bad smell, like almost like death, Mm -hmm. like something died. They couldn't find it. At one point, you know, they can't find clean lays to help them. Fred's a manager of a restaurant, actually the Riverboat restaurant. 
There was one in one of the famous buildings downtown, right? It's I think in, so. Um, this is pre-World Trade Center. This is uh, Empire State Building or something? It's in it, one of the, the it, more famous buildings It may downtown. have been. I know it's a, it a pretty big restaurant in New York he's managing. But he spends one weekend with her, and they just literally scrub everything in the house trying to get rid of this smell. Mm-hmm. They have the windows open, and they would get rid of the smell, and the smell would come back. So I've read a lot of reviews of this book in which people make make much of her Irish Terrier dying. And these reviews kind of suggest that Jan was implying that it was this haunted house that killed her dog. Mm-hmm. And I want to give her a little bit more credit here. I, don't, I didn't get that. Mm-hmm. I didn't get that at all. I got the impression that she felt that being there in this haunted house had sort of convinced her that there was something else after life. Mm-hmm. She wasn't sure what. She's very sort of agnostic about it. Mm-hmm. But she feels like these are ghosts that are haunting it. These are people or things that were that were once alive. Mm-hmm. Let's say that. And I think she's more troubled by this idea of I mean, she just loved this dog. Like she mm-hmm. literally you know, wrote poems about it and so forth. I think she's more troubled about the idea that its soul went somewhere and she doesn't know where. You know, she, mm-hmm. she wonders, like, she, she's now convinced that life goes on in some form. There is an afterlife of some form, let's say. And I think she's just more, like, troubled, like, her beloved pet. Like, where did it go? So she's convinced that that things go on. So I don't really, I didn't get the feeling that she blamed the house. Mm-hmm. The dog was older. You know, it wasn't it was, like an unnatural was, death where they just found it and it was yeah. inexplicably dead or something. At some point after her dog dies, one evening, something small and furry runs over her foot. She thinks at first, you know, immediately, oh, Penelope, you know, and then she realized it was, it was too small and Mm -hmm. just, it wasn't right. So she thinks there's a rat. Well, that would make sense with the grape. The interesting thing about this is when this happens, she's cast in a role in a play called Bell, Book, and Candle, which is a play about witchcraft. Oh, yeah. And... She's actually practicing the spells from the play because they're oh. they're these spells. She has to memorize the wording for these spells, and she's actually in the middle of practicing these spells when this thing runs over her feet. And again, like when she was blindfolded before, she says, "I never practice those spells again in the house." She calls in an exterminator then because she thinks she has rats. Mm-hmm. The exterminator comes in. He can't find a sign of any rats or mice at all. He says, like, I just... In New York? <laughs> that's, what, that's what the exterminator said. So later on, Fred convinces Jan to, to get a new dog, finally. And after some searching, they adopt a somewhat rare breed from the pound. What is it? It's... I'm going to try to pronounce this right. We should probably ask Tina for the pronunciation, but uh, it's a Hungarian pointer. It's known as a Visla. Oh, wow. And the crazy thing about this, the synchronicity about this is they get this new puppy, this Visla, from the pound. They bring it home. And her poem she wrote about Penelope, her first dog, is published. Mm-hmm. And Fred brings home the magazine from the magazine stand. And she's reading her poem. And she flips to the next page. And there's a story about this breed of dog, the Hungarian Visla, is on the very next page. Oh, wow, well, that is a little odd. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, I mean, directly on the page after it poem. So it's this, you know, re- like literally turning the page. Yeah, yeah. And there's. Oh, I do like that. <laughs> you know, really, really neat synchronicity. They finally acquire the services of a new cleaning lady. They finally get somebody that'll work there. Jan was in again in another part of the apartment. She hears the cleaning lady talking to something, and she says. Who are you speaking to? And she says, oh, a cat. Oh, no. the ca- That's another strange familiar yeah, thing. Yeah, ghost, ghost cat. Cats. Yeah. And she says, we don't have a cat. And the cleaning lady took this in stride. She said, uh, oh, it's just a little ghost cat. It won't hurt you. And this cleaning lady was much more comfortable with the unknown than the previous ones. That is very accommodating. Yeah. <laughs> She's a keeper. Fred finally becomes convinced. You know, before he was kind of like, okay, he was mm-hmm. sort of humoring her. The grape was like, he finally admitted something weird was going on, but mm-hmm. he, he finally becomes convinced that, like, there's something serious going on in this house. One night, it's a rainy night, and they hear their new dog, like, groaning and moaning and, like, like just making these sounds they've never heard this puppy make before. Like it's sick or something. They don't know. Mm-hmm. They don't know. And they go to it. And it's it's growling at something unseen. It's got the hair raised on its back, and uh-huh. it's just backing away, looking at something that, that it can see and they can't. Ugh. 
when animals do that, you're like, what are you seeing? They said, she said it never took its eyes off of whatever uh-huh. it was looking at. So this drives even even Fred. Again, he's a World War II vet. He's kind of a tough guy. Uh-huh. You know, it drives them out of the apartment for the night. They're just, let's get out of here. And then they decide they should move. So how much, how much time has passed since they bought the house to now? Like a few years? She ends up living between the two places she lives in Greenwich Village, I think it's 10 years. Some time passes. You know, this is, she starts in 1957. I think it goes well into the late 60s by the time they finally move out of Greenwich Village. They do move out temporarily, mm-hmm. which we'll hear about. So they are unable to find a new place. Well, we're talking 60s Greenwich Village, right? So this place is booming at this point, right? Yeah, I, and she she wants to find a, a nice old place. You know, she doesn't uh-huh. want to live in a new apartment. But they're just having trouble finding a place and... Eventually, Jan gets in touch. She sees this guy on TV, the first famous ghost hunter. Who's that? Hans Holzer. Now, would would I know anything else? He's yeah, he's he, famous he, for he, Amityville Horror. Oh, that is the first horror movie I ever saw. I, you know how? I mean, I don't know. I think the problems I had with the dogs that I would see. Mm-hmm were a precursor to that but when i saw that movie it just enforced it and i was like ruined for weeks as a kid seeing the amityville heart that was what i don't know why my parents let me watch that <laughs> that is very <laughs> affecting and it's a similar story right because it's the house itself that's kind of haunted right S- supposedly now yeah. you know a lot of questions come up around the amityville house a lot of people yeah it's been kind of debunked hasn't it and then some people come back and say I think some of the people that lived there said it wasn't, and uh-huh. one of the children says it was. And, and is that sort of one of the the starts to the trope about um, the the Native American graveyard? It's, like, it, it's definitely part of it, and that has to do with this, this medium, which we'll hear about. Oh, so tell me about Hans Holzer. Well, Holzer, again, he was this first kind of famous ghost hunter. He's written, I don't know, like 100 books or more about ghosts and, and so forth. And so he was an investigator? He was an, an early investigator. He worked with different mediums. Let's read uh, Jan's letter to Hans Holzer. He, okay. She sees him on TV. Mm-hmm. She looks him up in the phone book. His name's in the phone book because it's, you know, early 1960s. <laughs> yeah. why, why not? Anybody just look. She calls him up. He answers the phone. Mm-hmm. And she, she tells him a story. And he says, write it down for me. Send me a letter. This is Jan's letter. Her oh, actual cool. letter to Hans Holzer, where she talks about the house. Dear Mr. Holzer. My call to you last evening concluded with your request for a capsule report on the nature of the phenomena that is making itself more and more manifest in my ambience. (laughs) I live with my husband and dog in a converted mansion off Lower Fifth Avenue, which was the the turn-of-the-century townhouse of Lillian Nordica, the opera diva. Oh, I've had photos of her. Really? Yes. Oh, opera divas come in again to this story as well. She was um, in like either Parsifal or uh, the Nibelung, so I have her in like um, like Valkyrie clothing. I had her for a while. Oh wow, cool! I have heard too that at one time or another the house was owned and occupied by the Thomas Fortune Ryan family. In addition to its own distinction, the house is flanked by one of the former Mark Twain residences and the erstwhile family home of the poetess Emma Lazarus. I live on the very top floor, which in the area of mauve decade elegance. <laughs> had been the servants' quarters. From the day I took up abode here, despite the quaint charm of the apartment, I have sensed something dark and brooding, something of unrest enveloping the premises. Now I no longer merely sense this amorphous but pervasive quality. I know. Briefly, this knowledge has been built up during a five-year residence upon the following. 1. The sound of something having been dropped, often quite loudly, which upon investigation discloses nothing. And always, always the sound of footsteps, sometimes tentatively, sometimes furtively, but always audibly and ceasing suddenly to be followed by a faint rustling in the room that announces another presence. Number two, the appearance one evening at a recently vacated dinner table of a small dried grape neatly centered upon a dessert plate whose contents had been quite thoroughly consumed a few moments before. Number three, the fright of a black cleaning girl upon claiming to have seen a woman in white go quickly through a small room and whom she assumed to be me until she found me in another part of the apartment the same room having a vague sound of activity in it around 2.30 and 3 o'clock in the morning, and, too often for my shredded nerves, the sense of a tangible presence having come to stand beside my bed and jerk me fearfully awake from my pre-sleep state. Number four, the agitated actions of a dog whom we have lost, who would stare into apparently empty space, 
then cautiously stalk something or someone out of the room. Brr. <laughs> Number five. And now a new dog who is strongly reacting to things my material vision cannot penetrate. Two weeks ago, this highly sensitive and intelligent puppy was drawn in the small hours of the morning to an empty chair at which she sniffed violently, raised her head, laid back her ears, and quickly retreated. Number six. Once again, this is the piece de resistance, which prompted my phone call to you. A few evenings ago, my husband and I were having a quiet conversation when suddenly a wild, weird sound came from the puppy who was lying facing the disturbed and disturbing small room. We looked in amazement to see her mouth open wide, with half-wail, half-moan sounds coming from her throat, all the while that she quite plainly followed the progress of someone or something. When we rose to investigate, she entered the room gingerly, sniffed hard at the daybed, and retreated. There have been other things that I shan't attempt to catalog here, little things, and yet they loom large in creating an overall motif in psychic tapestry. By profession, I am an actress and writer, and am an ardent amateur archaeologist. I seem to have a rather peculiar magnetism that prompts people to stare at me unabashedly. Yeah, magnetism. <laughs> I would have stared at her unabashedly, I'd say that. And that often draws quite perfect strangers to me with unsolicited confidences. Yeah, I bet. <laughs> for some time, I have become aware that I am endowed with the psychic gift of precognition and for evoking a potpourri of odd little occurrences that more mundane personalities are content to label coincidences and dismiss at that. Almost from the time I have moved into this apartment, I have experienced a tremendous surge of interest in all matters pertaining to occult and spiritual science. I am psychologically aware of the fact that the considerable vicissitudes of my life have forced me to search for answers not supplied by traditional theologies. But this is no mere heightened nervous state with which I am contending. It is the gradual opening of a door that has been latent in my psychic equipment, and with the deepening of my knowledge is forcing more and more of the unseen into my consciousness. The apartment has been a milestone in my development, but with it has come an ominous sense of foreboding, which seems to come as much from without as from within. She's admitting it's mm -hmm. it's outside and, and within her. At this point, my emotional growth cannot keep abreast with that of my intellect, and despite myself, I am quite frightened of the environment in which I live. If there is a message being conveyed to me, I do not know how to translate it. My husband and I are trying to find other quarters, but until they materialize, we need help. Please do call me and come soon. Many thanks, Jan Bryant Bartell. That's a little slice into her writing too. Like how she's she does have a flair for the dramatic. I yes. mean, you could tell she's an actress. So Holzer comes to the apartment. He interviews the Bartells. He takes some photos, and he tells Jan, "Call me the next day." So the night he leaves, at about two a.m., she smells this sickly sweet odor, which gradually turns into this kind of foul stench she then hears movement from something unseen so she was sleeping basically on this day bed mm -hmm. and she takes all of her bedding she goes and she sleeps in the tub she wants nothing of sleep. and she's at this point you will enjoy this she's sleeping with all the lights on mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> smart <laughs> but she can't sleep there she goes mm -hmm. and she sleeps in the tub she calls holzer the following day and he agrees to bring a medium to the apartment when he comes back, he has one of the photos with him. He had taken a photo of her, of course. Yeah, of course. Just to see if there's anything floating around yeah. her aura. And there was. There was this weird... Eyes up here. <laughs> <laughs> My aura's up here, buddy. <laughs> there was this weird uh, white kind of mist, she said in this photo. Now, she does not reproduce this photo, so I don't know what it looked yeah. like. Yeah. But she said there's this kind of weird white mist and another like unidentified white shape kind of around her. And Holzer says to her, you're a medium. <laughs> Actually, I'm an extra small. <laughs> <laughs> and he says that, that, that that was Jan actually manifesting phenomenon. Like that was proof oh, that she wow. herself was a medium and she was you know, able to manifest and interact with this stuff. I bet she hated that. <laughs> he brings his own medium with him to the apartment, though. And he is not a medium? He is not. He has one on... He's just a ghost hunter. Oh, okay. He has this medium he works with. Is this a famous medium that you've heard of? Or? It is. Bartell doesn't name her in her book, but uh, Hans Holzer writes about th this apartment, and he names a medium, and we'll get into that in a moment. Oh, okay. So they're sitting down, the whole group of them. It's Jan, her husband, one of her actor friends, Hans Holzer, his wife, and this medium. 
And uh, from the start, this medium says, I, I feel a presence here. Of course. There's something sitting on the couch between us. Someone, I think she says, sitting on the couch between us. And I think an end table actually moves while they're all together. And, like, no one sees it move. Now, I don't know who was sitting next to this end table. Yeah. She just says it, it had kind of, like, fallen over against, like, a radiator or something kind of while they're all sitting there. And the, the medium gets up. It's like, oh, someone's here. Hmm. And uh, she goes on to put on quite a show her head starts rolling about and her eyes roll back in her head and her voice changes who's coming through do they tell oh she tells she tells in great detail oh i'm sure she confirms the smell which she says is a dead baby under the floorboards okay (laughs) back it up here i have a feeling i'm just guessing now i don't know much about the half-life of fetuses under the floorboards Mm mm-hmm but I would say after six years of living in a house, the smell would eventually dissipate to the point well, where... Well, you would think it would as well, because this is attributed to a abortion in the 1850s or something. So Yeah, that's... Yeah, you, you would think it would have been des- quite desiccated by yeah. that point. Then maybe it's a ghostly smell. But uh, yeah, that's what she says. She confirms that there is the ghost of a cat in the apartment. And I don't believe Jan has mentioned the cat. Okay. She said she purposely kept some things back from Holzer. She wanted to see what he would be able to discover. And then she gives details on names and dates of people, very specific names, which actually, to Jan's credit, leave her kind of doubting the medium Mm -hmm. and the medium's accuracy on this stuff. Remember, they're living in converted what was the servants' quarters. Mm Mm-hmm. And the medium comes up with this whole story about this woman who's trapped there. And she says, I, I will never leave. Hans Holzer makes this big show of, of saying, you, you leave these people alone. You leave them. Mm-hmm. And she says, I will never leave. I'm trapped here. I can't leave. Because apparently <laughs> they changed the floor plan of the building so the ghost can't get out. Even I though- feel like ghosts are smart, smarter than that. They can understand that floor plans change. You know, she names these people, and, and part of the detail of the story is this this woman who was trapped there had a husband who died in the Civil War, but had another lover, I think, who made her a ring. Now, I don't know how many servants are hooking up with guys that, that make jewelry, you know? It, well, and let's also talk about the fact that um, the average Civil War soldier was making the, about $12 a month, and he somehow is... A jeweler on the side? Well, no, the, the, I think the, the, the husband is... So there's two men here. Okay. The one is making her the ring, and then she, I don't know what happened to him. And then the husband is, is drafted in the Civil War. Because, oh, okay. Because when she's in a trance, Hans asks her, who is president? And she says, Abraham, Abraham, but they killed him. Nobody's ever... Pre- it's never like James K. Polk. Right. It's, always, <laughs> it's never then, like, like a boring president with... And then it's this ghost is apparently seeing a ghost there's double layers of ghosts because this ghost says i see him i see him there i see john standing at the window john is covered in blood he's covered in blood yeah and then it's too much then the medium just kind of kind of comes out of her trance there's some really interesting things about this this uh is taking place on november 27th 1963 do you know what happened on november 22nd 1963 uh, yeah, I do. And that was? The Kennedy assassination. The Kennedy assassination. John, John is covered in blood. Uh, yeah. And they're asking this medium, Abraham, Abraham, but they killed him. And then this woman sees John, John covered in blood at the window. There is, culturally, this is an impact on the American Psyche, consciousness. Yeah. yeah. This assassination. And I wonder if this, if this medium has any abilities at all. Mm-hmm. If she's not picking up on ghosts. But she's picking up on this energy of the assassinated president that's in the air. Mm -hmm. And she's saying, John, John, he's covered in blood while they're talking about this other president, Lincoln, Mm -hmm. who's been killed. You know, so Holzer's account is published in his book called Ghosts I've Met from 1965 in a chapter titled The Townhouse Ghost. And he prints Jan's letter Mm -hmm. and then tells his version of the night that he brought the medium to Jan's apartment. Most of the details are the same. He notes the apartment is moody and furnished with impeccable taste. Wow, that's what I always go for, but fall flat. <laughs> <laughs> now, he names the medium. 
in his book, which Jan does not name. Her, uh-huh. her name is Ethel Johnson Myers. Otherwise, the details are, are pretty much the same as Jan's account. He leaves out the, the sort of overdramatic acting of the medium. He doesn't kind of get into that. And he leaves out one fact, which I found hilarious. When the medium's done and comes out of her trance, and she's just too exhausted. Mm-hmm. Hens holds her, gets up, and walks into this the, the main room where most of the activity mm-hmm. happens. And he goes, shoo, shoo, shoo. And he, like, waves his hands like he's shooing something away. Jan finds this incredibly silly, kind of ridiculous. and But he says something like, no, no, it'll help. It'll, it, it'll help. Like, he's shooing the ghosts away. He leaves that out of his own story. Yeah, of even he realizes how ridiculous it is. Ethel Johnson Myers was the medium he took, by the way, to the Amityville house. Oh. When she got out of the car at Amityville, the first thing she says is, there was an Indian chief buried here. Of course there was. I believe this has been proven completely yeah. false. Yeah. There's no burial ground there. Uh, I think it's been they've researched it. Mm-hmm. It's just absolutely not true. In the Amityville case, they made a big uh, to-do about her being possessed by a man and she drops her voice several octaves like when she gets possessed like it's a different voice coming out of her oh. well the interesting thing about her mm-hmm. she's a voice teacher oh well if anybody has the ability to do that it would be somebody who's a voice she's teacher. she herself is an ex-opera singer and uh. a voice teacher this is someone who knows how to use her voice if anybody can go up and down octaves and, and do this kind of stuff it's an ex-opera singer it's funny, this is, has a lot of parallels to, uh, more parallels than I thought to last week's episode on Houdini meeting with yes. the mediums. Yeah, it really does. So Jan is, let's say she's not super impressed with Holzer. Mm-hmm. She does try to stay in contact with him, and he says he's going to look up these names that this medium has said. Yeah, because at this point, if you're a medium, people can't just immediately get on the internet and go, yeah, I looked at the census, nobody was living there by that name. <laughs> right, yeah. And I think the thing that's funny is that she's some, even though she's incredibly in tune with this and knows that there's a fetus under the floorboards, she neglects to mention the very famous residents of the of it, the building. Exactly, yeah. <laughs> Holzer eventually finds someone with a name similar to what mm-hmm. the medium said, who was like on 8th Street or something. And he says, well, that must have been it. It's close enough. Eventually, Jan gives up trying to contact this guy. And she reads an article that he's been helping a more famous actress with her haunting in her townhouse in New York. And she thinks, um, oh, okay. He's, he's traded up. Yeah. And she really gets that feeling and just kind of like, okay. Who's the more famous actress? She does not name her. Oh. So I don't know. So the Bartels finally find another apartment uptown. Now, this is a cool thing, and I think this is a synchronicity for us as regards this book. Okay. On their last night in the apartment, she sees this black shadow again. It shows up again. So the first night and the last night. This time it coalesces into a more identifiable form. It's a black hat-wearing black cape figure, which she describes as looking like the figure from Sandman Sherry. I just bought that decanter. Like, it must have been, like, within... In the same location where we bought this book. It might have been the same day. It might have been the same day. It might have been the same day we got this book. So I would try to put a picture up of this decanter. It's this really cool decanter of this guy in a black cape and a black hat. And we got it at the same place. We got this book around the same time, if not the same day. Yeah. It might have been the same day. It gave me chills. I was just like, whoa. Yeah, you might have seen that there's a like a famous French poster of the Sandman. It's the Sandman that has the E in the middle, right? Yeah. Yep. Where he looks like he looks like a comic book character, doesn't he? He becomes he like, the like the shadow. Or uh, speaking of connections to last week's show, it looks very much like the shadow. Caped figure, sort of yeah. a Carter, sort of a V kind of a for vendetta kind of a So she sees this figure and then it just moves, she said, with incredible speed. Another thing we hear from the doorway right to her bed in human speed just zooms right over to it looms over her and then just leaves i'd like to hear that this is the end of her haunting that that was one final shadow and then it isn't is it it gets darker oh (laughs) so they move to this like an unhappy series of apartments they move uptown at one apartment, there's a prostitute living above them, which they take to court. And Sounds up, problematic. Yeah. Eventually, she calls one of her old neighbors just to say hello. Mm-hmm. And she's talking about how much she she dislikes living uptown. And the neighbor says, why don't you move back? There's a place right next door. So this is the other half of the house. This is the other half of the house. This is, if they were, I think that she was at 16 before and she's moving to 14. Mm-hmm. 
West 10th Street. This is the house that was occupied by Samuel Clemens. Mark Twain. Mark and Twain. His... Basically, there's a wall separating where she lives from where she used to live. So if you're a ghost, this is not an obstacle, really. I mean, that's what she's thinking. But they have a period of relative calm where she's like, it's it's a much nicer place. Now, she doesn't like... The, at this point, it's in the late 60s. Now, what she doesn't like is Greenwich Village is now... Hippiedom. Yeah, there's hippies everywhere. She doesn't like that the old antique shops are now like head shops and people come into the Greenwich Village and they're selling drugs and she's seeing like she has a whole poem she wrote about miniskirts you know how they reveal too much well there's an influx of youth which she's quite obviously no longer a part of I love your takes on this stuff honestly like yeah that's I think that's a big part of what's going on here so there's a period of relative calm where you know she sort of begins to other than the changing neighborhood she's Mm -hmm almost enjoying her surroundings in Greenwich Village again. But then their neighbors, both people and pets, they start dying at this alarming rate. Cancer, one person's like murdered on his doorstep, mugged and killed right on his doorstep. Complications from alcoholism, like just one thing after another, these people are dying off. And they become convinced, the Bartels become convinced that this house is cursed and they make plans to move Ten families lived in this house, she said, in the, in the site she was in. So it must have been huge. Mm-hmm. And they move then to a cottage outside of the city. There's some other synchronicities she talks about in this apartment, which to me, they're kind of like lesser synchronicities. Like they move in and they find a book. And in this book is a pen and ink sketch of Mark Twain. Mm-hmm. To me, if you're living in a place where Mark Twain lived, it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that people before collected Mark Twain stuff, you know? Yeah, because... I mean, and, and Mark Twain being so kind of ubiquitous to yeah. the American experience, I, I wouldn't say that's a huge leap. She talks to the maintenance man at some point and asks him if he's ever heard anything there. He talks about the boots that never stop walking. Mm. So he's hearing stuff and he says the maintenance man before him actually saw Samuel Clemens. Did you know that Samuel Clemens' uh, ghost is, uh, can, what's the term when they use it for saints, bilocate? Um, what's the term? Bilocation. Yeah, bilocation. Mm-hmm. Yes, he's, he's seen at more than one of his residences. Oh, I'm sure he is, yeah. <laughs> so again, they move to this cottage finally. They're co- totally convinced this house is cursed. I mean, to the point where she's like, if we stay here, we're next. And honestly... Which she'll never know is that it is an odd form of precognition because yeah. horrific things happen there. So they move to this cottage outside the city and the deaths at the Mark Twain house continue. And she takes comparing the deaths to the nursery rhyme, Ten Little Indians. Which also is like the Agatha Christie novel and the movie would, would have come out like within a year of her saying this. Well, I looked okay. up when that came out. I remember reading that in, in school. And before too long, there are nine deaths associated with this place or either people living there or people closely associated with it at one point i think the maintenance man calls her and says you're right it's cursed and she says like you, you should get out of there he's like where am i gonna go this is my job this is my mm-hmm. where i live but i think the landlady even dies you know just people keep dying and finally like, like jen you know says several times she's she attempts to start writing spindrift this book and she can't do it she can't mm-hmm. do it she, she writes other stuff she'll sit down and write other stuff but she can't write this and finally in this cottage she sits down to write spindrift and i will read the editor's postscript jan bryant bartell finished the writing of spindrift in march of 1973 after delays in the typing as one typist after another fell ill she delivered the completed manuscript to the publisher on may 14th with elation, she looked forward to moving back to her beloved Greenwich Village, however, far from 10th Street. On June 18th, Jan died alone in her home in New Rochelle. The coroner's report listed the cause of death as a heart attack. So, as is noted on the inside flap of the book, Jan is the 10th Little Indian. Doesn't seem like she died of a heart attack, though. Mm-hmm. It seems like she committed suicide. I'm having a hard time finding that information. I was trying to find it. She's sort of... She and her her husband, is he deceased at this point? Yeah, uh, at the point she kills herself? Yeah. No, he lives on into like, like the, the, the 80s. 80s. Yeah. yeah. In fact, it's odd. He might die at a very similar time to something else awful that happens in the house. Mm. Yeah, this I think it's on Find a Grave where people said they researched her mm-hmm. and she committed. They, they found out she committed suicide. I'd like so, to find that. Yeah, I was trying to find her obituary or anything else. In any case, I could see, you know, this book's published in the early 70s. I can see them changing that detail, maybe. Yeah. 
the thing that's curious about that too is that's almost about the same time that Deanne Arbus kills herself as well. Really? Yeah, she kills herself in the early 70s. Oh, wow, that's really interesting. So I want to read the last two paragraphs of her book. Lacking the presumption of the doctrine theologian, I have no easy answers. Only psychic signposts pointing to states of consciousness as yet unexplored. Only veils of Maya hiding myself from myself. These are the things that haunt me now, these ghosts of an uneasy tomorrow. Uneasy because we've lost our way and a vast psychic sea must be crossed before we can come home to ourselves. If the spindrift has not reached you yet, it will. It will. And that's the last thing she writes. And she's only like, let's see, she dies. She's early 50s. Uh, yeah, she's only in her early 50s. Yeah. But as you said, the age is, I mean, for someone as beautiful as her, you know, age. That's clearly, like, the picture on the back of the book is not her at 53. No, I'm thinking that picture's from the 40s, maybe? 40s yeah, she, or 50s? Yeah, or she's, she looks much younger. Oh, yeah, she's gorgeous. I mean, again, she's just gorgeous. As you hinted at a couple times, I think, the tragedies at this address continue. This is an article from the New York Post. I'm going to just read some excerpts from it from October 28th, 2012. It's called Terror on 10th Street. It's all about this house. Yeah, which is sometimes called the the murder house, isn't it? The house of death. Mm -hmm. Or the most haunted house in New York. Yeah. Bartell's story of torment is just one of the documented legends swirling around the abutting numbers of 16 and 14 on 10th Street in Greenwich Village. The block, an otherwise picture-book New York byway that's home to writers and actors, is so dripping with tales of death and hauntings, number 14 has earned the nickname, the House of Death. Residents have reported seeing the ghost of Mark Twain walking around in a white suit and hair, along with a spectral cat waving its tail and a woman in a long flowing gown passing through doorways. But some say there's a curse that touches people who live there. Bartell died under mysterious circumstances just a few weeks after finishing her manuscript about her experiences in the house. Most notoriously, number 14 was the site of a grisly murder in 1987, when former criminal defense attorney Joel Steinberg beat a six-year-old girl to death. Number 14, considered a classic brownstone, was built sometime in the 1850s, right before the Civil War, when the area around Washington Square was booming. It was originally one house, but is now split into ten different apartments, at least nine of which had names on the buzzers and mailboxes. Legend has it the house witnessed 22 deaths, not terribly unusual for a a century-and-a-half-old home, except some of those spirits never left. The most famous was Twain, who lived there for a year in 1900. A plaque outside the door brags of his tenure there. Though he died in Connecticut, one resident reported seeing a specter resembling the author, saying, My name is Clemens, and I has a problem here I gotta settle, before disappearing. Not all the ghosts have been like kindly old Sam Clemens, however. Residents have reported sightings as recently as a few years ago, and some of them have been chilling enough to scare people away from the building forever. Dennis, a musician and photo buff, has lived on the third floor in number 16 for more than 20 years. He didn't want to give his last name because he was embarrassed to be sharing ghost stories, but he says he has seen little clips and visions of women in long gowns going from room to room, as well as experiencing seemingly random flickering of lights. Fifteen years after Bartell died, a much more shocking real-life tragedy occurred in the house next door to her old home. At number 14, Joel Steinberg, a well-heeled lawyer, and his girlfriend, Hedda Nussbaum, an editor of children's books at Random House, appeared to be a prototypical professional couple. They were well-liked on 10th Street and told friends and neighbors that they had adopted two children, six-year-old Lisa and toddler Mitchell, 18 months. But their middle-class facade crumbled in November of 1987, revealing a drug-fueled den of horror and abuse. After freebasing cocaine, Steinberg beat Lisa, leaving her bruised and broken on the bathroom floor. He went out to meet friends, leaving Nussbaum too frightened of Steinberg's wrath to help Lisa in the next room. Steinberg returned home late that night. He and Nussbaum freebased more cocaine until around 4 a.m., with Lisa still unconscious in the bathroom. It wasn't until 6.30 a.m. that Nussbaum finally called authorities. When police arrived, the second-floor apartment was in eerie disarray. Nussbaum answered the door with her face bruised and battered, her lips split open. She wandered the apartment, hiding behind doors while medics attended to Lisa. Mitchell, soaked in urine and covered with dirt, was tied to a playpen with a length of rope around his waist. Lisa died three days later in the hospital. Residents of the building had reported Steinberg before on suspicion of abusing Nussbaum and Lisa. Dennis, next door, remembers seeing Joel in a tender moment, carrying the girl on his shoulders. Steinberg was convicted of first-degree manslaughter and served 16 years in prison. 
the investigation revealed that he had never legally adopted either child. This is um, a case that I actually remember. It made the news because Hedda Nussbaum sort of was one of the first people to claim that um, the domestic abuse that she suffered made her incapable of responding to the child's needs. Oh. And I remember seeing her on Oprah. It was it was a really big case at the time, part of the like sort of that uh, late eighties tabloid culture. Mm-hmm. That, like you know, we true crime is so popular now. This was sort of that first inkling of true crime on television, right? In yeah. that capacity, just the precursor to reality TV. This is like the time of like Oprah and Phil Donahue and Sally Jesse and all those. And I, I d- distinctly remember seeing Hedda Nussbaum on those shows, and they were you know people were grilling her. Why didn't you call? Because they said that she, this little girl, would would not have died had she gotten her had treatment. she gotten help mm. initially. Wow! You want to hear one good part to this story? Yeah, I was going to say, is there any way we can end on an up note? Um, I read the follow up that the little boy named Mitchell, who because he was illegally adopted, was given back to his biological parents, who were college students, mm-hmm. and grew up to be okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. That's actually good. Yeah, I'm, isn't I'm, that like... Yeah. like oh. <laughs> I'm like, okay, so there's a little bit of good news to end, end <laughs> yeah. with. So that's the story of Jan Bryant Bartell, who becomes one of these figures in Strange Familiars that I'm sure we will... Uh... She'll probably end up one of your saints, like <laughs> <laughs> William or... <laughs> so that's the story of Spindrift, Spray from the Psychic Sea, this book that sort of almost literally fell into our lap and the little synchronicity with the Sandman decanter. Yeah, because those decanters were only made in the 60s. So it's not like this is something, like when we got it, it was already this like fragile decanter that somebody had saved for 50 some years. Wow. And it's something that you took to the antique store and before I even read this book... I said, I'm bringing it back. It's too cool. I I don't want to sell it. I think I'm going to keep that. I think I'm going to keep that. We ended up keeping it and yeah, I'll try to put a photo of both the book and there's the, also the i mean curiously they also made a white version interesting yeah interesting well i like that we have the black one because it matches yeah. what she saw uh-huh. well dogs played heavily into jan's life love no i'm gonna look up what kind of dog that was i'm really the, curious to see what this the hungarian pointer yeah And of course, we talk about dogs here every week when we talk about 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy. So what if your dog is growling in the corner at a spectral figure? Is that something that 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can handle? I think it is. I think it is. I think 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy could help with that. The Bartels adopted a puppy, a young puppy, if they would have needed help. And 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy was around. I'm sure Tina would have offered to help them. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can help you with your puppy whether they're seeing ghosts or not. (laughs) They have a relationship-based approach that helps you and your puppy become perfect for each other. They have online sources like video lessons, a secret Facebook group where you can talk with other puppy owners and they share what they're going through and sometimes the lessons they learn can help you with your puppy. You can find them at sithappens.us. You look for the 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. They can help you with mouthing and biting, potty training, fear and nervousness. I guess if they were seeing ghosts, that would fit in with that. Barking, chewing on furniture, shoes, etc. Anything they shouldn't be chewing on. Crate training, hyperactivity issues, leash training, and more. 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy can teach you what to do, but also, and perhaps more importantly, they can teach you what not to do. Again, you can find them at sithappens.us. Look for that 90 Days to the Perfect Puppy link at the top of the page. Before we get into the photo of the week, I just want to thank our patrons, as we always do. Thank you, patrons. Thank you for your help. We can't do the show without you, so your help means the world to us. If you want to help us and get extra shows besides, we have 60 of them now, and I think we're going to do an extra one for Halloween, so there should be 61 patron shows before the month is out. If you want to get all that and any new patron shows we do, you can become a patron at Patreon. It's patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. You can sign up for a monthly subscription or you can sign up yearly. And there's all different levels there for things like artwork, t-shirts, and more if you want to sign up and get rewards. Again, you can check it out, patreon.com slash strangefamiliars. Don't forget to share the show on social media. That helps us. And make sure to like and subscribe wherever you're listening to the podcast. That helps as well. And leave us those nice five-star reviews, which gets the show in front of new potential listeners. 
And if you want to make a one-time donation via PayPal, you can go to our show notes under any episode. There's a paypal.me link there. And that, of course, helps as well. So we have a nice pretty lady for our photo of the week. She very well could be. She's posed the way a lot of like sort of lower level opera stars are posed. Like a lot of actresses would have tons and tons of these photos made. I, she's not identified, but she's so dramatic looking and the jewelry being the focal point there. That's, that seems to be something that more of the dramatic sort of actress types tend to do. And so, plus she has this sort of forlorn look and dark hair. And so she reminded me of Jan. <laughs> has a, a little bit of a Jan vibe. Staring wistfully off into the ghosts. <laughs> yes, with amazing yes. jewelry. <laughs> yeah. This is a CDV from Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania. Not traditionally known for a ton of actresses. But <laughs> <laughs> Estimate on the year? Well, it's a carte de visite. So I would say she's probably late 1860s. So this could have been the woman that was in the house up there in New York. That is, her spirit is now trapped there. I mean, we don't know. We can't say for sure. Yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> nearly impossible. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's a it's a very very nice clear CDV. We will put it in our Etsy shop. If you go to the show notes under this episode, there'll be a photograph of this. You can click on that. It'll take you to our Etsy shop where you can purchase this and other photos of the week. There's a few left in there from other weeks. I'll have to look at that with a loop, but she um, she might have hair work, like memorial morning jewelry. I was wondering about she, that. I think she has a hair, hair work earrings she's wearing. Very interesting. Also in our Etsy shop are all my books. You can get them there. You can't get the new art book on Amazon, but you can get the new art book in our Etsy shop. You can get original artwork. Uh, this week's show art the artwork for this week's show yeah absolutely mm -hmm. strange familiars t-shirts all kinds of stuff etsy shop name lost grave one word or you can just look up strange familiars we should come up so we got a box from karmic garden this week they always smell better than the other random boxes we get <laughs> <laughs> with the sort of test scent for the new strange familiar scent that i think they're going to be making it's the perfect strange familiar scent in that it is like um, your Catholic childhood mixed with the woods. That's what it smells like. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't even think about it like that. Yeah, because it's like frankincense and vetiver, right? Frankincense and myrrh and vetiver. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I didn't even think about it like that. A scent combination in which we didn't know if it was going to work, neither us nor Karmic Garden. I was like, I don't know. I like those three things. Yeah. Let's see if they work together. But I quite like it, and I guess they'll be making that soon but in the meantime you can get all their good smelling stuff yeah they have all kinds of scents there amazing stuff karmic garden it's etsy.com slash shop slash karmic garden or you can just type in karmic garden one word i think their shop will come up in etsy they have soaps scented sanitizers natural cleaners candles beard balm and more go ahead and check them out etsy.com slash shop slash karmic garden karmic garden trusted remedies made from mother nature that's it for this week. We will be back soon with more Strange Familiars. Strange Familiars is a production of Dark Holler Arts. Music, books, art, podcasts, and more. DarkHollerArts.com Intro and background music is by Stone Breath. Go to StoneBreath.BandCamp.com for more. We're on Facebook, Facebook.com slash Strange Familiars, where you can join the Strange Familiars gathering group. And we're on Instagram, at Strange Familiars.